Hello, uh, we are come to the fourth part of this, um, uh, this, this sessions of seminars. Um, we have talked about the developmental model and then we have gone into each stage. 0 to 3, 3 to 12 and now we have come to talk about the stage of adolescence. How is it to be an adolescent in time of war and emergency? Um, I, I wanted to say this, uh, the, the overview of this lecture is to say what happens to us normally. What is the normal development uh, during adolescent time? What happens to our brain, to our body, to our relationships? Um, and what are the most core developmental tasks during this period? And can they be disturbed by being exposed to trauma during this period? Um, what are the most common reactions when exposed to major stress, stress and trauma reactions? It might be some repetition here that you have heard this before, if you have heard all the different parts before, but we think that repeating some of the main points is good. Um, and then we, I will try to say something about good coping strategies during this period of time. So let's talk a bit about what happens normally. What is it that happens between 12 and 18? It's big, we all know it's big changes in our body. We grow a little uh, and we get female or uh, male um, markers. Um, uh, it's a lot of hormones that are uh, uh, operating in the body. Um, uh, we need, uh, as young people, we need much more sleep, for instance, and that is hard because you, you are used to, you don't want to go to bed early. So you are staying up late in the night and then you are tired all the day in the morning. And then you should go up to school at regular time and you have all this, this is normal conflicts in the family with uh, young people. But it's not only the body that changes, it's huge changes in our brain during this period of time. It's, it's called a sort of reorganizing how the brain is structured. Um, that is a good thing because it's also a time for repairing things that wasn't really going well during previous time. But um, the main change in the brain is that the prefrontal cortex where we do the logical thinking, the planning of the future, that we see the consequences of our action, that is not, that doesn't develop during this period of time. But the emotional brain has a large expansion during this period of time. So it's not only the hormones, it's also actually the brain that makes young people be more emotional, more instable, more uh, uh, dangerous seeking perhaps, or more experimenting. And they don't really have the capacity to think about the consequences of their actions. That comes actually not before we are around 25. So uh, this imbalance between very much emotions going on and very little control and planning and consequences is, you know, why it, this period is special vulnerable for strong impressions. So our feelings and emotions changes, but also our social belonging. Uh, I think that um, young people are so concerned about friends. They are so dependent upon friends. And friends' opinion of them 
matters more than their parents' opinion upon them. So it's, it's very big changes actually that happens during these periods of time. And you know, when, when they grow older, they know more about how to regulate these strong emotions and how to regulate between balance between the friends and the uh, peers and their family and other relationships. And they become more, more um, concerned about planning for long-term planning, for future, for professional, etc. So uh, the developmental task during these periods is, you know, it's, it is finding your identity. It's who am I? Who am I when I'm with my family? Who am I when I'm with my um, friends? Um, who do I belong to? Because, you know, our family, we haven't chosen our family. But now we are in a period of life where we choose who we want to belong to. So this is a big challenge and big developmental task to find out where do I belong? And how do I balance this being independent? I want to be independent, feel I'm myself, feel I can manage and still be dependent of, upon my family and my close relationship. Then this sexuality starts and the intimate relationships and how to find out where, how to orient oneself and how to feel that yeah, I'm good enough. And then this is also a developmental task is actually to start this preparation for the future or for your professional life. Um, uh, and it's difficult and it feels like a big demand upon many young people. Um, and then it's what we called when we talked about the developmental model. This is also a period where values are important. I have to choose what kind of values should be dominating in my life. What kind of, what do I think about justice? What do I think about social responsibilities? What kind of, uh, do I, I have, want to have a religious kind of life? Do I want to have a political view? Do I have some, some idealistic values about climate or about uh, human rights, etc. So this is a very, very important developmental task in this period of life. We said that during major or traumatic stress, we have this activating, this tense feeling, this, this um, overactive uh, in the, we talked about the window of tolerance that you easily get over activated or uh, under activated. We have this avoidance behavior that you, you don't want to talk about it. You don't want, you don't have the words for talking about what you experience. And, and you have this re-exposure. So um, how does this, how can we meet this? How can we assist young people during, to sort of help them fulfill their developmental tasks? And how can we help them through this stage? Um, I'm aware that I've talked very much about post traumatic stress. And when we talk about Ukraine, we are not post, we are not after the trauma. You are still living in it. So um, I've been inspired by a man called Hopeful, who has um, been writing about how can we support uh, young people so, and help them re-enter their developmental path so they don't so they can fulfill their developmental tasks 
And he says, of course, when you're living under stress, there is always safety first. You have to feel safe in order to develop. So that means, so we go in, we will go into each of these factors. So uh, the young people need to feel safe. They need to learn something about self-regulation and how to calm themselves down. And then more than ever, they need to feel this, what I call internal locus of control or what he calls that you have the power to influence your situation. And, um, and uh, uh, social support is also a very, very crucial factor that helps young people, but it, it's not only receiving social support, it's also giving social uh, support towards others. Feeling that you are of use for someone. Uh, so both, the mutual support. And then they need some kind of activity or assistance to be able to start planning their future. It's not it's not important if that those plans become reality. It's just help them re-enter the, the capacity to think future, not to be um, pessimistic and think I don't have any future. Sometimes with young people, I we talk about future and I make them plan different kind of scenarios not to find the right one, but to make them be engaged in, yes, there are several possibilities in my future. So let's see a bit about each of these factors. When we say safety first, we say, of course, it is about a physical safety. It's about knowing where to go if there is a danger. If there is a safe place somewhere, if there is a basement, or if there is a shelter. So, of course, um, knowing where to go in times of alarm or shooting, explosion, etc. is important that they know this. But it's also safety in routines, in structure, in school attendance that the routines are not uh, totally um, chaos and that you have a structure during the day also makes you feel more safe and secure. So this uh, structure and rhythm routines are so important for the feeling of safety. And the other thing is help them self-regulate and calm down. And now we are going to do an, a demonstration. So I will invite Elizabeth to come up and I'll try to do some exercises with you that you can teach. teach. And then I'm going to sit down together with you and I'll tell you what to do. And in this seminar we have put three uh, exercises, but we will also, there will also be av available other exercises that we will put online. Okay, the first one is a breathing exercise. So I'll ask you to sit comfortably and lower your shoulders and close your eyes. Imagine a square in front of you. And, and I want you to think that while you uh, imagine the right side of this square, you breathe in while counting to four. 
One, two, three, four. And then you imagine following the line on the top of the square to, to the left side. One, two, three, four. And then you imagine the line on the left side downwards, breathing out. One, two, three, four. And then you hold your breath while you take the weight, one, two, three, four, until you start again, one, up, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, hold, four. You can repeat that three times for yourself. I put in a one who's not here, but that I like and had just came into my mind. Look at me at uh, once. You can also think that when you inhale, you activate the body. When you exhale, you, you lower, you calming your body down. So it's sometimes important to inhale more quickly and exhale more slowly. So sometimes we see, we say, imagine that you look at, and then that you look at a leaf falling from a tree while you breathe out. And then wait before you breathe in. And breathe out. So actually that's the most easy exercise, but the square is also okay. Um, so then I'll try to do a grounding exercise. Why, why is grounding important? It is important that when we are in stress, we sometimes lose contact with, the, with what we are on the ground. And we are in our head. And when we are in our head and not in our feet, we are easily more activated. So I want you to sit on your chair and feel your feet touching the ground. Stamp your left foot into the ground. And then stamp your right foot into the ground. Do it slowly. Left, right, left right, left, right. You feel the contact with the, with, the with the floor here. And then put your awareness to the ties and buttocks in contact with the seat of your chair. Notice if your legs and buttocks now feel more present or less present than when you started focusing on your legs. And now move your focus to your spine. Feel your spine as your midline. And slowly try to somehow lengthen your spine. And notice if that affects your breath. Put your hands together. Um, and then push your hands together and feel your strength. And release and pause. And repeat. And now move your focus to um, your eyes. Look around in the room. Find something that tells you you are here. Do 
Can you tell me a focus that you have chosen? The planets? Mm -hmm. Yes. You are here and now and here you are safe. Notice this exercise affects your breathing, your capacity to be present, your mood and your strength. And then there is a last exercise that I would like to demonstrate. This will take in, in uh, when doing it in, with uh, traumatized people, we use a bit longer time than I do now for demonstration purposes. Um, but with um, this is called a muscular tension relaxation exercise. And I've done it very many times with young people, with adolescents, and they prefer this one, in my experience, because it's concrete and it's not only relaxation, it's also strength. So start with focusing on your hands, make a fist, hold it for five seconds, release. 10 seconds and then repeat. Really make a strong fist, hold, and then relax. And notice, be aware of the difference between the, the, te the release state and the tension state. And then move the focus to your arm, pull your four Worm uh, towards your shoulder. Feel the tension in your upper arm. Make tension in the upper arm. Hold five seconds and release. And then once again, hold and release. Stretch your arm out. Lock the elbow. Feel the tension in the triceps. Tense and release. And once again. Tense and release. Focus on your face. Increase the tension in your forehead. Lift your eyebrows. Hold the tension and release. And once more, hold your eyebrows high and release. Can you uh, imagine having a tension in your jaw? Bite. Keep the tension there for five seconds. Release. And focus then on your muscles in your neck. Bend your neck so that your chin, so that you, in the, your cheek meets the, um, the, the fore part. Touch your, turn your head slowly to the left and then bring it back to the center and release. And then turn it to the right and release. Focus your shoulders, lift them, hold. Notice the tension in your shoulders and release. Notice the difference between holding and releasing. 
focus on your shoulder black, black blades, pull them back, increase the tension, and release. And repeat once more. Hold, release. Then again, stretch your back, sitting in a very upright position. Stretch, 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 and then relax. One more time. Relax. And you try to increase your tension in your buttocks. Hold for five seconds and release. Once more. And then breathing in. Hold your breath in your stomach. And release. Again. Tighten your stomach. And release. Strengthen your legs. This time make your toes point um, stretch your legs. I feel the tension in your legs. Hold and release. Stretch the toes first forwards and release. And then take it up and make the toes point at you. And release. And this other foot, the same. And then again, put your feet on the ground. Now I want you to scan your whole body. Does any part of the body feel tense? Remember forehead, jaws, neck, shoulders, arms, back, stomach, buttock, thighs, legs, feet. Scan it all and if there are tension somewhere, then repeat the exercise that was directly focusing on that area. Good. Imagine that a relaxed feeling is spreading through your whole body. Your whole body feels warm, perhaps a little heavier, but relaxed. So how do you feel? More present. More present, yes. It's it's um, it's an uh, important lesson for all of us that we, when we get scared uh, or stressed, something happens in our body, and you can change your feelings by changing your body. That makes you feel more mastery, more that you have more influence on your own and that you are able to regulate some of that whenever you become tense, you have to be aware, where, do, where in my body do I notice and is there something I can do to feel the difference between tension and relaxation. Okay, thank you. So we are back to Hobbfall's five factors. The one was safety, the other was calming. And his third was this about to influence uh, your own situation. That could be like this that we have done now. Uh, but it is also 
to have influence upon your own situation could be very small things, but that you feel that you are influencing. I remember uh, when working in, in Macedonia with the Bosnian refugees that we said to one of the girls, uh, what do you want to happen? And she said, I want it to be peace in Bosnia. It's not easy if you are a 12-year-old girl to make peace in Bosnia. But we, when we asked her, is there something that you want to happen in the next week? And she said, yes, I want to go to the swimming pool. And we said, okay, let's make a plan. How can you influence that this is going to happen in your life? Someone is taking you to the swimming pool next week. Let's make a concrete plan. That's, you know, a small thing, but it's helping them to feel that they regain a sort of influence and turn locus of control in their life. Um, which is, it's important for all of us. It's important for us as because uh, trauma is also, among many things, it's also a feeling of helplessness and that you haven't influenced what is happening to you. So to take back the feeling that I'm not only someone whose things are happening to, I'm also someone who can influence something. Um, and the uh, hopeful fourth factor was this receiving and giving social support. Belonging to a group, I think if possible in the uh, city or wherever you live, is if it's possible for young people to feel a belonging. It could be in the school, in the classroom, it could be in an activity like football or other activities, but that they belong together with someone because friends and peer relationships are so important in this period of life. Um, and I also remember that, um, I remember one uh, research about uh, um, Kurdistan where a doctor uh, examined children who was uh, in the mountains because they had fled from the war activities and he found out that all of them had a lot of PTS symptoms. And then he examined them later, three months later, and the boys seemed to have recovered uh, automatically or normally, but the girls still had a lot of, of symptoms. And his explanation actually was that the boys got important tasks to do. They had to be spiders, they had to find out where the enemy was, they had to find wood for making the family warm, but the girls had no duties. The girls were sitting passive in the tents. So what he explained was that the element of required helpfulness, that you feel that you are important, that you have a duty that somebody needs, is also very, very important if you can find some kind of tasks that make the young person feel important and helpful and that he is needed or she is needed. And then social support is also about sharing. It's about sharing emotions, it's about sharing thoughts, sharing uh, feelings, uh, sharing activities, but the, the belongingness and the sharing is combined. And then the last that hopeful uh, um, emphasizes is this plans and hopes for the future. Sometimes we do, we make um, small uh, videos or small uh, plays where they, um, I remember in, in Bosnia I made a sort of play where the, the young people were to say what will happen when Bosnia 
when there is peace in Bosnia. And one said, we will win the, uh, the football, the world championship in football. And we made sort of um, number one, number one, number two, number three. And they played, you know, receiving the, the gold medal for football. And then they said, what would what do you think will happen in your own life? And some said they wanted to play um, a wedding, they wanted to and sing the normal wedding songs, they wanted to, uh, to make a scene where they received their diplomas from the school, etc. They wanted to play being a, a professional lawyer or a doctor. So we had a lot of play about how to imagine the future. So discussing it, playing it, talking about it, telling each other dreams about the future, they don't have to be realistic. But that you, you are starting to think there is a future. It's so, uh, um, it's so important. And it, it also could be in school that you write about the future. So these are the five factors that Hopeful says is important, especially in adolescent time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.